Where in that area do you place a BDA? How do you make that, that really site-specific decision? And the, the thing that we always go back to uh, every time considering beaver dam analogs is what would a beaver do? Uh, beaver typically build dams on riffle crests. And so that's what we do. We follow that uh, thinking wherever possible. And the riffle crest is, is of course, the highest place in a stream bed and relative to say an incision trench or the, or the stream adjacent surface of former floodplain. So what we're doing by using the riffle crest is minimizing the distance between the bed of the stream and the uh, former floodplain on the uh, surface above the incision trench. A, a classic uh, where you want to build one because you're at a riffle crest, and we've got the pool upstream and then the ripple down. So, so right, right for that transition is. So that's kind of key. Um, it's not always the case that that works because sometimes there might not be a good surface on the uh, former floodplain. So you want to go up out of the incision trench and take a look around on that surface and see if you can see uh, ideally evidence, if you're, if you're lucky, evidence of an old beaver a complex, maybe some uh, uh, channels or some sort, but e even if it's not uh, old beaver habitat, you can look for evidence of side channel flow uh, or at least a wide enough area on the on the former floodplain such that if you put the BDA at the location, you're going to have water backing up uh, onto the floodplain and and going into side channels such that you get dispersion of flow. So the, the idea being that the flow that you back up, instead of just pouring over the BDA, it pours uh, goes onto the floodplain and pours into some of these side channels such that the flow is dispersed. And of course, that will help reducing unit stream power and, and that will help reduce scour and that and then allows aggradation to occur, and so you build your bed up. So that's the thinking. The other consideration in, in this is, of course, the BDAs around a particular BDA, and especially downstream. And so sometimes it can be very helpful to put in a, a secondary or lower BDA, and that forms a water cushion downstream, and it, it minimizes the distance between where the water re-enters the stream and the floodplain above. The more you minimize that change in, in elevation or change in head, the, the more likely it's going to be stable. And again, that's something that you see beaver doing. Anytime that there is an incision trench, well, it starts to widen uh, in places, and so you get inset floodplains. And those can be very good uh, uh, places to put a BDA, a, a riffle crest with a inset floodplain above it or around it. Uh, those are those are great places. Any anytime you've got them, uh, you're dispersing the stream power, so you're dispersing flow, and that reduces the ability of the system to scour uh, and and transport sediment, and it increases the potential for it to deposit sediment. So. Same principle as getting it up on the floodplain, um, uh, the, the former floodplain up at the top of the incision trench, but oftentimes you can't actually get to the top of the incision trench in one shot because it, it's so deep. So if you, if you kind of think about doing this in three foot steps or one meter steps, if you've got a two meter incision trench, you're not gonna be able to get flow up onto the top uh, original surface in, in one go. Really thinking about how these systems work in relation to each other is important. Uh, a common approach would be downstream of your main BDA. Uh, you would have a, a step-down BDA, which would just absorb or create a, a step, as the name implies, such that you don't just have, say, a three-foot drop uh, into a, a plunge pool, because then you have the potential for scour and undercutting of the of the main BDA. So a secondary, uh, you know, we call it sort of a, a water pillow. You're creating another pool down there that, that just reduces the scour. And, and we've even had a, a series of those, two or three, you just step it down, step it down and get it back to the original grade. 
You know, we've learned something useful about placing deflector dams in relation to channel spanning dams. When determining which structures should go where, the primary question is, what do you want these post lines to accomplish? So if you want a deflector dam to push the power of the stream against the bank, you want to make sure that water is flowing freely around the deflector dam. That means you don't want to have a channel spanning dam too close downstream or it will backwater the deflector dam, making it less able to do its work. Your deflector dam may end up buried in sediment, which still contributes toward overall project objectives, but can basically render the deflector dam ineffective to the point where you could have just left it out of your plans. But if your deflector dam does end up buried in sediment, you're probably not going to be too disappointed to see the stream bed come up that high. It would be a testament to how dynamic this technique is and how you can accomplish your project objectives for the reach even when things don't happen as you expected on a structure to structure level. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're planning each location because you can only have so much control and you can always adapt depending on how things unfold. Here we've converted a deflector dam into a channel spanning dam. We'll talk more about that kind of thing under adaptive management.